Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining today's webinar. We're going to get started in about seven minutes. Thank you.
Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Chia Halpern Bitso with the Tribal Law and Policy Institute. I would like to welcome and thank you for joining today's webinar, Funding for Crime Victim Services, hosted by the National Congress of American Indians and the Tribal Law and Policy Institute. Please note the control panel on the right of your screen. This includes information for your audio pin in case um, you maybe later have some questions that you would like to be unmuted for. Uh, you can type any questions you have into the question box, which is a third from the bottom on your control panel. And please feel free to ask any questions during the webinar and or during the Q&A session um, at the end of the webinar. Also, please note that there are four handouts on your control panel, and that's in the handout section, which is the second from the bottom. Included there are the OVC solicitation for the tribal set-aside, five sample, sample narratives, um, which are some of the grantees from last year's award. And please note that the, um, the solicitation requirements are considerably different this year. So what you see there are just some examples of ideas, but it will not be in the same format this year. Also, there is a document, an OVC grant management checklist, which was developed by Fox Valley Technical College. And um, that's just you know, something to take a look at that might give you some ideas or um, be helpful. And we also developed some templates from um, TLPI and NCAI. And please note, um, these are just something that we developed to help you get thinking and get the thought process moving on some ideas for um, things that you can fund or um, just, just as some examples. Please note, these are not um, by any means the best thing, the gold standard. It's just, you know, your tribe may have developed something better, but we just wanted to put something out there for folks to think about. And we will send out the PowerPoint slides within 24 hours after the webinar today. And uh, with that, I would like to turn it over to Virginia Davis from the National Congress of American Indians. Thank you, Chia. Uh, good afternoon, good morning. Um, Chia, can you advance to the next slide or do I have the ability to do that? Uh, thank you all for joining us. We, uh, Our primary goal, as Chia explained, is to give you some information today about a funding opportunity that's currently available. If you made it to this webinar, I assume you know that. Um, but uh, as everyone likely knows, two years ago, Congress created a substantial new funding stream to try and address um, the crime victim services need in Indian country. Um, and that solicitation is currently open, and that's what we're going to be talking about. In addition to myself from the National Congress of American Indians, I'll be joined today by Jerry Gardner and Jessica Harjo from the Tribal Law and Policy Institute. You already heard from Chia. And then we're also very uh, grateful that Allison Turkel from the Office for Victims of Crime, the office that's administering this program for the Department of Justice, uh, is able to join us today as well. Next slide, thank you. Uh, before we get started talking about the funding, I wanted to highlight for everyone that there is a tribal consultation that the Department of Justice has scheduled um, to talk about this funding and to talk about how it can be administered uh, in future years. Um, like I said, this was a substantial new program. This is only the second year that it's been in existence and it takes a while to get a program like this right. So this consultation is going to be an opportunity for um, tribes on a government-to-government -government basis to talk to the federal government about what's working with the funding, what's not working with the way the funding's been ad being administered, and how um, together the tribes and DOJ can build a program that'll work um, to meet the needs of victims in Indian country. That consultation is going to be taking place on Tuesday, August 20th in New Buffalo, Michigan. Um, when we email you within, you know, 24 hours after the webinar, as Chia explained, there'll be more information, including how to register uh, for the web or for the consultation. Um, it's happening in conjunction with the annual consultation on violence against women. So the um, consultation on the crime victim services funding will be on Tuesday, the 20th, and then Wednesday and Thursday of that week, there'll be additional consultations on other topics. You can register online, but you can also register when you uh, show up in New Buffalo, Michigan. You don't have to do that. Um, 
NCAI will be um, facilitating a tribal caucus on the evening of August 19th, for those of you who travel in for the consultation, to give um, tribal leaders an opportunity to talk among themselves to prepare for the consultation. Um, we'll send information out about that as well after the webinar. Um, and OVC recently released a framing paper for the consultation. And what that fr framing paper is, is it provides some background information and some questions for tribal leaders uh, to consider. In particular, it lays out some, some thinking and some options for um, a formula that could potentially be adopted in future years to distribute this funding in a different way. Um, and if you all have questions about the consultation, we are happy to answer those as well. But at this point, we're gonna shift to talking about this year's funding. Okay, so a few pieces of key information to share at the outset. Um, you can find the solicitation. Can you advance the slide? I'm just seeing a blank slide still. I don't know if others have. Oh, now we went back. Okay, so as I already mentioned, the, um, the program is being administered by the Office for Victims of Crime at DOJ. You can find the solicitation either in your handouts box uh, in your control panel, or here's the web link. Um, OVC has already hosted a number of pre-application webinars. Two of them are available online if you'd like to watch them. Um, you know, it, it can be useful to hear the questions that were asked and answered on previous webinars. Um, those can be great resources for you. Virginia, I, I would just add too that it's not just the recording of it, but you can also access the PowerPoints, and you might want to just print off one of those sets of OBC's PowerPoints so you have those available for reference. Great, thanks, Jerry. Next slide. I also wanted to um, point out that um, the solicitation uh, changed a little bit along the way. Um, so I want to make sure that when you uh, pull down the solicitation, make sure that you're using the final version. Um, one of the ways in which the solicitation changed was um, a, a change to the deadline. So the deadline is August 16th. That's a little later than was initially announced. Um, the deadline will be 11.59 p.m. Eastern Time. Um, there's some information in the solicitation about uh, what you can do if you run into last minute technical issues, um, but we'd really encourage you, it's, it's never a great idea with these federal grants to leave it to the last minute. Um, so even though you have up until 11.59 p.m., um, it's always better to submit a, a, a couple of days in advance to give yourself time to deal with anything unexpected that may come up. Um, OBC anticipates that the grants will start around January 1st, 2020. Um, the specifics of that for a particular grant may, may vary depending on, um, you know, the review process, but that's, that's what you should plan for. January 1st, 2020 is a start date, and um, the grants will be a three-year grant period. Next slide. Um, the eligible applicants for this uh, grant are a federally recognized Indian tribal government. That's the most straightforward. Um, tribes can also apply as consortia, or a group of tribes can come together and submit a single application. Um, and a tribe can also designate someone, a nonprofit entity, um, uh, or a, you know, a service provider um, who works closely with the tribe to apply on behalf of the tribe. That's the, that's the designee. Um, each tribe, each tribal government can submit only one application. So that means if your tribal police department is interested in this funding for victim services related purposes and your tribal domestic violence shelter is also interested, they need to come together to submit a single application. Um, the one complexity to that is that your tribe can 
submit its own application and also come in as part of a tribal consortia. That's fine as long as the activities being proposed um, are distinct. Uh, they're not um, applying both as a consortia and individually to do the exact same thing. That would be uh, duplicative and not permissible. Um, the proposals that come in, come in need to supplement your existing victim services um, rather than duplicating or supplanting things that the tribe is already doing. And all applicants must submit a current tribal authorizing resolution or other satisfactory evidence of legal authority from the tribe to apply for funding. That's really mainly an issue for designees and or a tribal consortia. Um, the idea is that DOJ just wants to make sure that anyone applying for funds on behalf of the tribe is actually authorized to do so. There's a lot more detail available about that in the solicitation, and if you have questions about it, um, we, can, we can address those later in this webinar. Next slide. So Virginia, on, on, on the issue of the uh, resolution, do, maybe we could check with Allison just to see um, for tribe is, is, is applying directly. Are we correct in assuming that a that an authorizing resolution isn't needed, um, or or are you requ is OVC requiring it for all? It is required for all applicants. So I can, can you shed? Yeah, thank you. Can you shed any more light on you know for a tribal applicant? Um, would a letter from the chief executive saying they have the authority to apply suffice? Or do they need a council resolution? Has to be a tribal resolution or a like legal document. So if the tribe uh, accepts itself a letter from the chair as sufficient legal authority, then that's sufficient. But if the tribe itself under their laws require a, a council resolution, then a council resolution is required. If we, this is Jerry Gardner um, at TLPI, and um, we're on slide on cautionary notes. So just keep in mind a series of there's, there's a series of cautionary notes here that this year's solicitation or this year's RFP is is substantially different from last year's solicitation. That last year, for those who were involved last year, it was a two-phase process. It was a streamlined process where what was required for phase one is significantly less than what is required um, now. Um, uh, here, this is just, it's just a one-phase process with a full proposal and a full budget required. Um, and so it's really important to carefully review this year's uh, solicitation requirements. Um, and we'll come back to this, I, I think, a, a number of times is that I would also recommend that anyone working on the proposal print out separately the attachment A uh, which goes through what's allowable and unallowable, um, and, and keep that as a reference as you're going through to make sure that what you're applying for are things that are allowable under the statutory limitations that OVC operates under. Um, so that's really important. Can we go back? Okay. okay. Um, so next thing is just to be cautious when relying on sample materials as the requirements are different. Um, that when we go through some of the different resources that she referred to, um, keep in mind that they were for different RFPs or different solicitations um, that didn't have as many, well, they had different requirements at least. So be, be careful in, in that regard. They're useful guidelines, but don't follow them close, you know, directly. Um, the next two recommendations are one is to be realistic about the timelines and funding. Um, and we provided one of the attachments is, is one that Fox Valley Technical College developed. It's, keep in mind though that it's specific for CTAS purpose area seven, which has more specific requirements of what you have to do in the course of the three year period than this uh, solicitation has. Um, but what it's useful for the Fox Valley attachment, what it's useful for is it gives you an idea of how long of a time period you might have to, to set aside for some of the different things that you would be doing. So if you choose to, and you, you don't necessarily have to, but if you choose to do a community needs assessment or um, a strategic planning process and the like, um, it gives you an idea of how long that might take. Um, and it's really important to, to make sure that you don't overpromise or under budget. So um, you need to make sure that you don't 
say you're going to do too much within the, the three-year time period or you're doing things that would require more funding. So just uh, be realistic in it, in, in, in what you uh, set out to do in, in that. Um, did, did you want to add anything to that, Allison? No, thanks, Jerry. I think we'll be able to address some of those as we get farther into the uh, PowerPoint. Okay, great, thanks. The next, then the next slide covers, and, and this again is something that's different in, in this one versus last year, which is that you have to select one of two purpose areas um, when you're uh, putting your application together. You can, can't apply for both. You can apply for just, you have to select one or the other. And the first one is the establishment, purpose area one is the establishment of a new victim services program um, and that's if you have no victim services, no existing victim services program. And uh, OVC also encourages new applicants for OVC funding are encouraged to apply under, under Purpose Area 1. Uh, so if, you have, if your tribe hasn't um, previously or at least recently received OVC funding, then you're encouraged to apply under Purpose Area 1. Purpose Area 2 is, this, is, is anyway in which you're coordinating or expanding existing victim services programs. So if you want to enhance or expand your victim services program, and, and that includes things like expanding the types of services provided, um, expanding the populations served. So if you previously, for instance, weren't serving um, uh, youth victims, uh, you could be expanding to covering youth victims, um, and expanding the types of crimes addressed. If you're just handling violence against Native women issues, for instance, you could be broadening to cover a, a, a broader range of different crimes. Um, so there's a number of ways in which you could be um, expanding existing victim services programs, and those could all be under purpose area too. Next slide. Okay, and, and again, uh, as, as Virginia was mentioning, it's a three-year grant period. It would start on January 1st, 2020, um, and then um, end on December 31st, 2022. Um, so I, I guess you could say that something starting on January 1st, 2020 would have, you would need to have 2020 vision. Um, the next, the, then the award amount is generally up to 720,000 over the three year period, um, but it, you, can, you can apply for more than 720,000 as long as you have adequate justification for doing that. So keep that in mind that the general limit is, is 720,000 over the three year period, but you can apply for more. Um, no match is required, um, and the use, there's a wide range of programs and activities that you can do here, but carefully follow Appendix A in the solicitation, uh, which I would encourage, of course, for you to copy out directly. Okay, here's, and this is just a sense of some of the general allowable costs. So here, this is just, I'm not going to walk through each one of them, but um, the Appendix, it's important that Appendix A is organized by the different budget categories. So it goes through what kinds of positions can you fund, what kinds of travel can you fund, what kinds of equipment and supplies. So um, it's very helpful in walking through each different thing, each different category that you would apply for. But you, you need to always check with Appendix A. Um, and, and you need to look at each of the costs and ask two questions, which is, is the cost related to supporting or assisting, or assisting crime victims? Um, and secondly, does the expense help crime victims? So those are, that's the link that you need to make. You need to look at each of the different expenses that you're putting there and make sure that each one can make that link uh, to crime victim services. Um, next slide. And then this is just an illustration of some of the different kinds of victim services. There's, of course, more information in Appendix A, uh, but it can cover a wide range. It can uh, cover a victim advocate or victim assistance program. It can cover emergency shelter, domestic violence shelter, transitional housing, um, development of victim rights, uh, 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 tribal code provisions, and things like that. There's a, a wide range of what it can do. Again, be careful that you don't overpromise or under budget. Um, next slide. And, and this gives just some of the ideas of the kinds of things that you can be, be fun, that can be funded from the needs assessment, strategic, strategic planning, program development, program implementation, um, and program expansion. This just gives you a general idea. 
you don't have to do everything here. Um, you know, you can certainly, you can do needs assessment and strategic planning. They're um, more specifically required for CTS Purpose Area 7, but for this solicitation, you don't specifically have to do those, but you could certainly choose to do those, those different activities. But keep in mind that, that you should do what is most appropriate for your, um, uh, for, for your program and your needs. And again, refer to purpose error or to, to attachment A, the, the listing of allowable and unallowable. And then the Fox Valley uh, handout on uh, gives you an idea of how long you might uh, schedule for different kinds of activities. Um, next slide. Okay, then that's allowable cost. Here's the unallowable cost. And, and this slide is really important to keep in mind because one of the problems, I mean, no matter how good your application is, if you're applying for something that's unallowable, um, then your proposal won't get funded or at least the proportion of the unallowable won't be funded. So it's really, really important that you're not um, applying for something that's unallowable. Um, and I'll walk through each of these in, in a minute, but I, I, I'll also give you the shorthand that we have used over the years sometimes. Um, and keep in mind that this is not something arbitrary on OBC's part, it's their statutory limitation because this funding comes specifically from uh, the Victims of Crime Act and, and the BOCA funding, and there's limitations in how it can be used. So the things you wanna stay away from generally are the three Ps. So um, prevention is one, and it here like, refers to primary, primary crime prevention activities. That's a really important one to keep in mind because a lot of the other funding that you're applying for might well allow that. So for instance, the OV, OVW tribal government funds, um, you can fund prevention activities, but you can't under this. So that's important. That's a really important one to keep in mind that you would not want to propose prevention activities. The second P is perpetrators. So you don't want to, that you can't fund here anything specifically for, um, uh, for perpetrators so, or services for crime offenders here. Um, uh, for, as an illustration, you could, um, if you know, for instance, that someone um, uh, who's in the federal prison is coming back to the community, um, you couldn't fund under OVC funding um, the uh, the services that that perpetrator would need to, re, to, to reconnect with the community. But what you could can fund is services to protect the community from that perpetrator, so that you could fund services to assist the crime victims in knowing that they're going to, be, you know, that the perpetrator's coming back, and those kinds of things. So keep in mind that things that are services directly for the perpetrator can't be funded. The third is that uh, law enforcement or prosecution, the third, the third P, prosecution, can't be funded, that you can't fund um, specifically law enforcement or prosecution activities. Um, and, and Allison may clarify this more a little later, but uh, certainly my understanding is that you couldn't fund a general law enforcement or prosecution position, but you can fund a victim advocate in the police department, for instance, or you could fund a, um, a victim advocate in the prosecutor's office, but it has to be a victim advocate position, a victim, or a position that's specifically addressing victim services. Um, and the last one is, is that you can't fund construction. I believe you can fund some renovation, but um, the general rule on this is that the closest you can get to construction is construction paper. Um, and then next, I'll, I'll turn it over to Allison Turkel, as the Deputy Director of OBC, who's um, kindly uh, joining us today. Hi, everybody. Thanks, uh, Jerry and uh, Virginia. Thank you, TLPI and NCAI, for holding this webinar. I hope it's helpful to everybody, and um, thank you for letting me join you. Um, I think there's information at the end, but also uh, we've done four other webinars, and uh, some of those are posted on the OBC website, both with transcripts, voice and PowerPoints if you want or would like additional information. So uh, as Jerry mentioned, this solicitation is different than the FY19 CTAS, the FY18 CTAS, or for those of you that applied for the FY2018, what we call VSSA, Victim Services Set-Aside Solicitation. 
Uh, this one is has a full single application time period, and it has two separate purpose areas. They are both for victim services. The first is for purpose area one, which is those that have no existing victim services program should apply under purpose area one, or those that have never had OVC funding in the past. The, this for the second, for number two, we are encouraging you to apply here. However, if you have a fully established victim services program that you're looking to expand and how you have not done created that program with OVC money, you can apply under purpose area two as well, and the descriptions of the things that you have in there may be more apt. But we really are looking to see new things uh, under purpose area one, and we more likely than not see more of those type of applications, not a requirement, but as uh, was mentioned for folks who may want to do community needs assessment, strategic planning, and uh, implementation planning, all of which are essential to setting up and running a new victim services program. Okay, move on. Uh, this is some ideas. These are not required. These are just suggested activities, as the sidebars show. Um, so you could uh, use funding to establish and identify partners that will play a role in reaching out and serving crime victims. One of the things that we noticed in prior recent applications, so I'll call your attention to this, is that if you're starting a program anew, you don't have one, then you're going to need personnel. So you're going to at least need a person whose job responsibility it is to do these activities that are recommended here. So we do, you don't have to ask for personnel. But if you don't have anybody whose job it is, who's currently being paid to pursue this, you may need to put in personnel whose responsibility it is to start working on the activities that you are applying for. So we would look for those things. If you have someone who does, for example, program development, then that person certainly paid under other sources could help to get this up and running. Or you may be looking for personnel maybe in year two and three. You may not need it in year one, for example. So I think earlier they said sort of think about these as three-year projects. And that is one of the ways to think about it. It's not just how do we fill up the funding, but what are the activities or the needs that we have in each year that may be distinct from each other. You could get and mobilize your partners. A lot of the work that is done around victim services clearly needs to be done collaboratively. You need to work with, if you have a law enforcement agency, you need to work with them. How are you going to serve the victims that report their crimes there? You want your victims to know that you're working collaboration with those folks. So you want to engage those partners. A community needs assessment it is usually a very important thing to do. Um, I, it's not required here. Some of you who are CTAS grantees for purpose area six or seven, you've known in the past that has been a required activity of those CTAS grants, and those have been handled by the TA provider. Under this solicitation, you can request to do a community needs assessment, a strategic plan, an implementation plan, and you would be allocating funding in your request in order to pay for consultants and others to assist you with that process. Um, you certainly cannot establish a program without a good, significant uh, strategic plan for what is your, how are you going to run this program, and then you need an implementation plan. How are you going to make that happen? How do you get that plan on its feet uh, and get people hired and get your policies and procedures in place and meet all the requirements that are necessary in order to assist victims? Uh, and then, of course, that beginning, how do you begin and what are you going to do to actually provide victim services? What is the scope of the things that your program is going to do? And so mo a lot of times in this new established purpose area one, we're going to really probably see a difference in what you're requesting between year one, year two, and year three as you're building out and moving and trying to grow your ability and capacity to run a victim services program. If that's what you elect to do, that is just one choice. The other choice you potentially could do as a first-time applicant, you don't have a victim services program, you might start engaging in how to receive services from some other entity. And that's also uh, appropriate and doable depending on what fits your community and what your needs are to serve your crime victims. You can move on. In purpose area two, who should apply under purpose area two? Applicants who already have a pre-existing victim services program and you want to enhance or expand that victim services program. So you may want to expand the type of services that you're providing to victims. So you may have had a smaller victim services program and you're only able to provide emergency services, for example, for victims. 
And now you may be serving the same victim population that you can anticipate that you're going to have, but you want to expand what those types of services are. Now you may want to bring in an in-house counselor, for example, and get people receive their mental health treatment within your program. That's certainly something that you could do. You could expand the populations that you're serving. So for example, if you have a domestic violence program and you've only been able to serve in the past adult women within that program, you may decide to expand the populations to serve teen victims of dating violence, or perhaps you know and understand that there's a need from a prior community needs assessment that you've done that you're not attending to and haven't been able to serve your male victims of domestic violence. I would use this here as a caveat also to mention, if you have a community needs assessment that has now, especially in purpose area two, that now you're trying to fill the gaps identified in that needs assessment, please attach the needs assessment as a, a document within your application. That would be very helpful for the reviewers to have to, so that they understand where you're coming from in saying we're going to move from this needs assessment and now fulfill those needs. And then you could also expand the types of crime that you address. So for example, again, maybe you have a domestic violence program and from a needs assessment or from when you've worked with victims, you've realized that you need services for child victims of crime, that you need to start to enhance and develop a program to serve uh, victims of child abuse. So that would be expanding the types of crime that you're addressing. And that's what we'd be looking for under purpose area too. Moving on. Uh, and what is the overall goal of Purpose Area 2? And, you know, we have goals for Purpose Area 1 as well, which is to help establish and get, get folks services where they have not had it before. But here uh, it is, uh, here are some more specific things. We, you may focus on uh, making your program be more victim-centered or much more culturally competent. You may have not had the resources to do that previously. Um, Jerry had mentioned, you know, we have a prohibition against providing for a law enforcement or prosecution. However, you may want to, in thinking about that concept of victim-centeredness, it may be that you want to put a victim advocate in your police department or put a victim advocate within your prosecutorial offices um, and then also expand services that may be particular to your community and the cultural needs of your victims. You may want to provide more services, improve the services you have, and expand to serve more victims. Certainly people have had limitations on the, the funding that they've had to serve victims, and many programs, unfortunately, have been only been able to attend to a limited amount of needs of those victims. So you may want to expand to become more comprehensive. It's really important, and I do think this is going to be a challenge as this program grows, which we're all ho hopeful it will over the years, um, and OVC is uh, going to uh, expand our services to uh, train professionals in this field, uh, but we think it's really important that you support folks who are going to be directly working with victims. There's a high percentage of uh, uh, risk for folks who work directly with crime victims to suffer from vicarious trauma. Do you need to build in your pre-existing program of services uh, for those professionals so that you make sure that your staff is up and healthy and running. That is definitely something that could be funded under this. Do they need more training? Do you, are you bringing on someone perhaps who's come straight out of college and you want to make them into a victim advocate? They may have learned things in the book in school, but it would be great if they could then go to specific training to help them uh, to expand and understand how to become a victim advocate. Those types of things are fundable under Purpose Area 2. Uh, also under Purpose Area 1. You may want to improve your coordination with partners. Um, one of the things, we uh, we were just up in Alaska and uh, we were at a CAC that we fund, but under another piece of OBC funding, uh, expanding victim services in a hospital setting, that CAC was able to expand its partnership with the hospital and expand the medical services that they were able to provide to their child victims. So now with this funding, are you able to bring in additional types of partners that in the past you haven't had an opportunity to uh, collaborate with or you haven't had the funding to work with them? And then you may want to provide services to crime victims for whom there were no services at all previously and you're definitely filling a gap. Uh, we can move on. And here are some examples, again, just suggested activities, as the sidebar say, for purpose area two. Um, you may want or need a project coordinator, a project director. Uh, previously, you may have had a program that was part and parcel of another program, but now with expanded funding, you may want to have a person who's 100% funded under this program to coordinate the new activities that you've proposed in your, in your uh, application. 
uh, you may want to do, you may have done a community needs assessment maybe a number of years ago, and you may have been providing victim services for a number of years, and it may not be necessary to do a full-scale community needs assessment, but you want to do a more limited program scan within your program itself, or maybe even across your partners to see if you're meeting all the needs that each of you understand your victims might need. Uh, we talk, talked about expanding the populations. You may want to purchase tangible items so to enhance services provided by your staff one of the caveats that I'll add here is when you're looking for uh, purchasing items so vehicles or computers or office material those have to be for staff funded under these programs that's one of the things that your grant managers if you become a successful uh, grantee will be looking at that the funding is covering materials that are used by a funded OVC program. So it's important that you are clear about that in your request. Uh, and you may want to now expand, as I mentioned before, into direct victim services, where in the past you may not have been able to do so. You may want to add emergency services uh, for victims of crime. And you may want to provide community outreach and education to let the community know that now you have a program where you're able to help victims and make sure that everybody knows about that. What I would say across all of these things, um, and if you heard my webinars before that I've done on the solicitation, please be specific. And that is on one of the caveats and warnings that I will have about the templates that are provided, which is using things that were written by other people is never going to be able to describe what your specific needs are. We are really looking for folks to describe their specific problem, not generalities about crime in Indian country or tribe in Native Alaska villages. You can certainly frame it that way, but what is the particular issue that is affecting your community? Why are you applying for this? And how are you gonna use these funds specifically to respond? I will get really forewarned folks in this expansion part and purpose area too. If someone has submitted an application uh, already under CTAS, which is pending FY19, you can apply under here. If you received FY18 set aside funding, you can apply under here, but it has to be for different things. And so merely putting in words in your description that say expand services is not sufficient. Specifically, what do you have? What are you looking to expand into? What specific things are you gonna pay for with these funds? And what is it in response to? So there has to be linkage between what, you're, what the problem is, what the needs are, and how you're gonna to attend to those needs. Let's move on. So this is, these are just ideas. You do not have to apply for things. There is a wider range of, of uh, crime victimization that exists. These are just ways of examples. You can uh, create or expand a sexual assault program, a domestic violence program. Uh, you can assist with victims of financial abuse and expl exploitation, unfortunately a burgeoning uh, growth industry for criminals. So we uh, think a lot of times those victims get missed. Um, you have one, may want to serve male victims of crime, which a lot of times that they also, there's not been funding available for that. So that may be a need in your community. You may have a small program. You want to, may want to grow it into a comprehensive victim assistance program. Folks we have seen over the last couple of years have uh, looked to expand their services to uh, either assist vulnerable adults and or elder uh, victims of abuse. Uh, you may want to put a victim advocate, as I mentioned, into a law enforcement agency. Uh, you may want to create or expand a child abuse program, and you may want to provide civil legal assistance for crime victims. I did want to mention that I did see uh, in the earlier slide that there was a uh, mention about, uh, or maybe it's in a coming up slide, <laughs> mention about funding uh, lawyers or paralegals or uh, things of that nature, maybe in an example. I do want to be really clear about this. Again, no prosecutor services can be paid for. No uh, defense attorney services can be paid for. That falls into that uh, piece where defense uh, uh, things for offenders cannot be paid for. That includes defense attorneys. Um, it includes defense attorneys in a civil uh, action as well. The type of legal assistance that is available for this is to serve crime victims. So if someone is going to bring on a full-time attorney or a full-time paralegal, you better be describing the expanse and the number of victims that you're serving. In many communities, that would be uh, basically too large a position uh, for someone. You can't use this money to hire an attorney for the tribe. This is very specified and has to be limited to providing victim services for crime victims. So if you're asking for someone to be paid 50% or 100%, 
What are the number of victims that they will be serving? What do you know about? And of course, one of the unknown quantities that we all work of in this field is victims do not uh, generally seek services. We are really trying hard to make sure that your programs are reaching out and getting as many victims to come forward as possible. So sometimes it's hard to project. But again, if you can't project, then you're not ready to sort of find what that might be. So again, you have to have that linkage of specificity between what the problem is, how you're going to attend to it, and how you're going to specifically meet those needs. We can move on. So now, now moving on. We, to we have, um, Allison, I'm sorry, we have some questions um, sure. that are related sure. to what you're covering. The first is, we have many communities that offer diversion programs for youth within their juvenile justice system uh, that could potentially provide victim services for youth that have been sexually exploited as part of ancillary services. So they wanna know if this is something that would be covered. Uh, it, it, that is a very complicated question to answer. Um, so it's hard for me to answer that question. Um, what I would say is that the focus has to be on serving victims of crime. And so uh, there's not a bar per se to attending to the needs of uh, youth who have been uh, victimized and then have uh, committed offenses. Uh, but someone's gonna have to be very specific. And again, the size of the problem would have to be written into that application and a way that it can be discerned that the services are focused on victims of crime. So there's no bar to it, but this would be something that would require a great degree of specificity and detail in the application. Okay, thank you. And the next question is, if a community wanted to develop a community needs assessment to assess current data on tribal youth exploitation within the community and then develop a strategic plan to the, address the identified needs, would this be allowable? Yeah, as long as this is focused on assessing uh, the needs of uh, child victims, um, as opposed to an assessment about the of offenses that might be created, co uh, committed by juvenile delinquents, then yes, that certainly can be, can be uh, developed. Okay, and the next question for clarification, victim service for tribal youth within a juvenile justice system that focused primarily on services rather than prevention, would this be allowable? Again, I'm gonna, this is a, they, they, these are difficult questions to answer. And so I, I, it, it, I don't wanna be, you know, sort of uh, too firm one way or the other. Certainly we all know if you work in the criminal justice system, you know, for years that unfortunately there's a crosshatch across those children that are victims of crimes and those children that engage in uh, criminal activity themselves. So uh, CVF money, money from the Crime Victims Fund and VOCA funding can be used to assist victims of crime. Uh, and and, and we are, there is a strong priority to fund child victims of crime. What there has to be great care for in applying for these types of things is that this is not bootstrapping to fund a juvenile delinqu delinquency program. That's what I would say. So if folks, again, can frame this and lay out the need, um, lay out how they're going to uh, discriminate, because at some point what happens when you get into this is it's realistic to us that at the door to services, it is very hard to, at that juncture, put up your hand and say, I'm sorry, we can't help you. You're an offender. Um, you're not a victim. And we don't want anyone to get into that situation. So if there is a distinct way that someone can serve victims of crime within the auspices of a juvenile delinquency program, there's not a per se bar to that. But I want to just be clear that uh, there will be problems if we run into that these become services for uh, juveniles involved in the criminal justice system and not for victims of crime. Okay, thank you. And the next question before we move on is under purpose area two, can funds be utilized for training law enforcement and court personnel to build their capacity to respond to youth victims of crime in a trauma-informed manner? Now that, that I would say this probably makes the most sense to train those folks to respond to all victims of crime with a subcategory of, of child victims of crime. Um, yes, again, as long as that is not, you know, law enforcement training or lawyer training, but that is focused on, for example, how to 
uh, uh, deal with victims in a trauma-informed manner, increasing the victim-centeredness of an organization, uh, perhaps doing forensic interviewing if they're dealing with children, uh, things of that nature would be acceptable. Okay, thank you. It looks like those are all the questions. And participants, please note that we will be sending out the slides and handouts after the webinar. Thank you. Okay, now we're getting into the application itself. Um, and you can see there are references to the solicitation pages in here. Um, there are three what we call critical documents. Some of you may be familiar with what we call documents required for BMR, which stands for Basic Minimum Requirements. All the documents must be submitted for this application. However, there are three documents that if they are not included in your application at the time that you submit and at the closing of this solicitation on August 16th at 11.59 p.m., we will not be able to review your applications. So please make sure you get these in at least, but we need all the other documents as well. Um, the first is the program narrative. This is the part of your application. I've referenced it when I've been talking about this. Jerry spoke about it uh, in his section, which is the description of the issue. Now, you can see that there's numbers attributed to this. The program narrative accounts for 80% total. Uh, there is, within the review process, weighting that is done in the system to weight uh, each section here. So the program narrative accounts for 80% total of your application. Uh, the description of the issue is 25%. Uh, project design and implementation is the most important, as you can see, at 30%. Capabilities and competencies is 20%. And your plan for collecting performance measurement data is 5%. Um, then the budget detail worksheet and the narrative included in it. The narrative is now not a separate part in any way, but each page of your budget detail worksheet includes narrative that must be in there as well that accounts for 20%. And the third document is the disclosure of pending applications, which is not scored, but it is a critical document that if you do not include it, you will not be able to move on. Um, can we go on to the next slide? Okay. Um, so this is the total list of documents that must be included. Um, the SF-424, I believe there's a separate slide on, so I won't go into great detail. One of the things I will say, for those of you that have only applied for the 2018 VSSA solicitation, the one that had the two phases to it, that was submitted in GMS. This application is submitted in grants.gov. One of the nice things about grants.gov is that it loads that SF-424 for you. It's a very important document, and we'll talk about it a little bit more. Um, but uh, it is already in there. You cannot move forward. It's not considered a BMR document, but you can't move forward in the system without uh, having a 424. Project abstract, we'll go over. We'll go over the program narrative a little more detail, the budget detail worksheet as well, um, indirect cost rate if applicable. We know that tribes, the Cognizant Agency, BIA, is sometimes slow on providing this. So we know that that'll be something that will maybe provided later, but do attach the one that you have. If you have never had an indirect cost rate agreement previously and you want to apply for the de minimis amount, which is 10%, you do need to enclose a piece of paper that acknowledges that that is what you're requesting. Don't not respond to that. If you're not going to use any indirect costs, you may have an indirect cost rate agreement. But the things that you are applying for, you may not apply your indirect cost rate. You please attach documentation as that to well. That will speed things up for you as if you become a grantee. There's that resolution that we talked about earlier. Uh, you must like, submit an application disclosure of high risk. That is not a form. It is something, again, that you need to fill out, which discloses whether or not you're a high risk, not only with DOJ, but with any other grant-making organization. If you are not high risk, please attach a document that says that you are not high risk with any other federal agency. And there's additional detail that you have to attach to that document. There is that third BMR critical document, disclosure of pending applications. Um, and if you get, if you don't have any pending ones, make sure that you say that you do not have any pending. And there's more detail to that. Pardon me, I have to take a drink of water. <coughs> you need a disclosure of lobbying activities, 
a financial management and system of internal controls questionnaire that is called an FCQ. You might be familiar with it. We have noticed in applications some errors in these. Please make sure your financial people at your organization or tribe fills this out. We did see a, a number of these where folks guessed the answers and then they were stuck with the guess and it put a hold on their grant funds. So please make sure that that's filled out accurately. And then other attachments as may be needed. <clears throat> Uh, you may have, uh, as we said, an approved strategic plan, logic model, or community needs assessment that your application is relying on, uh, and any resumes of key personnel. That becomes particularly important around uh, your competencies, capabilities, and competencies. You can move on. So this is the SF424 that I mentioned. So of course it's non-construction because you can't do construction with this funding. Make sure it says a new application. You can use this the standard language there. <clears throat> the date of the award is 1-1-2020, ending 12-31-2022. And here is the big one here. The amount of money that you are requesting must match the budget detail worksheet. So what could go wrong here? What could go wrong is the 424 is the first document that you're going to fill out. So this is up to $720,000 unless you make a sufficient justification why it's more. Let's use 720 as the amount. So let's say you say, oh yeah, we're going to request the maximum amount. We're going to request 7 we're going to request $720,000. You go through your all of your work, you do your detailed program narrative and all the subsections that are therein. Uh, and then you walk, work on your budget detail worksheet, or maybe you outsource that to your financial people to work, and you say, hey, here's our program, this is what we're asking for, can you put this into the budget detail worksheet? And when they run through the budget detail worksheet, it comes out to $690,000 on full calculations for the total three years. And you're like, wow, we're done, we finished all the rest of our paperwork, we filled out all these pieces of paper that Allison talked about, and you hit submit. What's the problem? Your 424 does not match your budget detail worksheet amount. So when you finish your budget detail worksheet, go back and check the 424 and make sure that it is the amount of money you are actually requesting, not what you started with. That will be really important. Otherwise, it won't keep you from getting a grant. It will slow you down in getting access to those funds. The other big uh, issue that we have seen over the last few years is some of you all are having consultants complete these applications for you or a grant writer. Uh, in the 424, there's a line that says authorized representative, and we have seen both grant writers and consultants put their name and contact information as the authorized representative. Why is that a problem? There's two things. The first is that we are going to outreach that goes to say you received this award and you must accept it within 45 days will go to the person that is listed as the authorized representative. If it is not the authorized representative, you may not ever find out that you got an award and I'm not making this up. We have received months after we sent notification requests from applicants saying, I never heard if we got an award and we're like, nope, we sent that out two months ago, but the person that they had listed never shared that they had actually received the award. So a grant writer or a consultant never shared the information. One, two. The authorized rent must be somebody who has the authority to accept the award. So that's a pretty important person, pretty high up probably in your infrastructure or structure of your tribe or organization. So please make sure that the authorized rep is actually an authorized rep. I will say this, the due date for these grants is August 16th. That is very late in the grant process. OVC money must be obligated no later than September 30th of any FY. So we are squished into the end zone here. Last year, when we did the two phase, a lot of you received outreach from my staff asking you for additional paperwork, asking you to fix things. There is no time in this grant process for that. It will all have to be done up front. So uh, anything that is not there, if you make it past BMR, it will just hold you up in the grant making process if we don't have that documentation and if you have not done it accurately. Thanks. Project abstract. So this is a clear and simple summary statement about your proposal, 400 words or less. Be brief, be clear, and be specific. Um, it is, should be for the general public. So 
look, I'm a Fed, I know, don't use acronyms. If you use an acronym, give a guide to what it is. You may be talking about your program. You may have an acronym for it. You may be talking about another organization with which you may work that has a great name, but nobody knows what it is. So uh, make sure that it's a separate attachment labeled project as abstract, um, and it does not count against the overall page limit that you have for your program narrative. Make it simple, single space using a standard 12-point font. We're feds, we like Times New Roman, so that's something clear and easy for the reviewer to look at with one-inch margins. Move on. Okay, the program narrative. Remember, that's the most important part of this application, 80% of your application. Please use double space. You can see the difference here. Using a standard 12-point font, Times New Roman, again, is preferred, and no less than one-inch margin. It should not exceed 25 pages. It can be less. Um, I would say in the FY 2018, the program narratives were eight pages. Do not regurgitate your program narrative from last year. It clearly will not meet the needs of this solicitation. Uh, as I said, these areas are weighted. What is the description of the issue? 25%, it's really important. What is the issue specific to you? What is it that you're facing? And you could give a brief, spend, spend a few lines on a, a overall description. We are really talking about what has brought you to apply for this complicated application. That project description and implementation, you've described the problem, now how are you going to respond to it? And here you can imagine there's all sorts of appropriate things that you would talk about, which is, for example, in Purpose Area 1, that would probably look much different than what somebody would apply for in Purpose Area 2. By the way, do not apply under both purpose areas. You can only apply under one purpose area. Uh, it might get a little bit complicated because perhaps you have a pre-existing program, but what you're what you're recommending or asking to do may be something completely different and new. The only way that that should be under purpose area one is if it's so separate and distinct, it's going to be under different departments, under a different uh, roof, it's a completely different project, you could apply under purpose area one. But if you're expanding that project, again, put it under purpose area two, what you have already. What are you doing now? Uh, what is this going to address and how are you going to implement it? And here it's really important uh, that there's consistency in here between this and your budget detail worksheet. I will tell you again, looking at other applications, what we've seen is some divorce between these two things. So someone may talk in their project description how they're going to, for example, uh, expand their programming to address child abuse victims. They're going to hire a victim advocate. They're going to hire a forensic interviewer. They're going to do training and uh, office supplies for those people. Uh, and then we go to the budget detail worksheet and it says three personnel. Well, that's not aligned. And the only thing that we can do, a reviewer looking at that, is eliminate one of the requests because it doesn't align with what your project description is. In the budget detail worksheet, you're also going to give a brief description. Those things should align across those two pieces of documentation. And then how are you going to ultimately implement it? And here's a good place where you'll describe <clears throat> the differences of what you might do in, in um, year one, year two, and year three. Um, the capabilities and competencies uh, uh, is uh, included in the program narrative. There is not a form for that. So you're going to have to fill it out. I think we have a separate slide, so we'll talk about that. So is the program the description of the issue, which we talked about? Um, what is the specific issue you have? We have a program. We've been unable to attend to this. This is the amount of victims that we think we have had. This is the size of our population. Uh, we, some of our victims we haven't been able to transport to services um, because we haven't any funding to provide for that. Services have been traditionally three hours away. Um, we've had folks that have been stuck when they have gone to receive services with no way to transport them back. Uh, in you know previous years, we've had approximately you know 20 victims of XY crime, 30 victims of this. Uh, we did a community needs assessment. We understand now we have the unmet needs of these types of victims. Those are the specifics that we are looking for, not generalities, okay? Moving on. And the program design and implementation section, as I said, it is the most important section. So I, we really want, and if you only applied before to FY18, we did not ask for this type of expansive description. Here we are looking for what are the goals, the objectives, and the activities that you are going, you're requesting funding for, and how does that serve victims of crime? 
What are you proposing to do? How will you utilize the funding to achieve goals and objectives? Make sure the information is consistent throughout. I just spoke about that between your problem, your description of the problem, your program implementation, and your budget detail worksheet. Those should all be aligned. Create solid goals and measurable objectives that are, here it is, specific, measurable, attainable, realistic, and time bound. Can you do this in three years if you are requesting a three-year program? And focus on a realistic timeline to complete your project. Capabilities and competencies, good, I'm glad we have this slide. I just so we talk about this, this is really important. This is a separate page. You should label it capabilities and competencies that's within your program narrative. And must describe a description of your management structure. Uh, what are your current and proposed professional staff members' qualifications that will enable them to fulfill the program's objectives? This will obviously look different between Purpose Area 1 and Purpose Area 2. Purpose Area 2, you probably have that infrastructure in place. You may be expanding it, but you probably have it. Provide the resumes for those people. In Purpose Area 1, you may be proposing it. You may not even get to your, you may be getting to your three before you have a full infrastructure in place, but you want to talk about what's the roadmap to get there? What are you proposing? It may change over time. What's your financial infrastructure? How do you manage? What is the setup of your organization or tribe such that you can then handle this uh, federal grant? It's very important. And describe how it would be managed, include any organizational chart if you happen to have one, or one that describes the roles of key personnel who manage and implement major stages of the project. This one accounts for 5%. What is your plan to collect data? So those of you who have been OVC grantees before 2018, there was always a data collection part that you had to fill out. Uh, but now in 18, uh, OVC has joined other agencies here at OJP, our federal program, and now you can, uh, you must use our PMT program on the right. You'll see there's a link that shows you what that looks like. It provides a lot of information, but for purposes of this application, you have to talk about how you will collect data that is related to this, the program that you are funding. Um, uh, you will be responsible for a semi-annual progress report who will be responsible for that. If you have any deliverables, some of you may not, your deliverable may be actually providing your services. And if you are going to be a grantee and have subgrantees that work for you, you're, that you're funding, you will have to then include how you're going to collect their data. That becomes very complicated, by the way. If you're going to be a grantee and have subgrantees, you also will need to be responsible and provide how you're going to monitor those subgrantees. Don't be scared of this. We're really just looking that we know that you have this on your on your plate when you apply for it and know that it's something you have to do. We will provide training and technical assistance on that as we go forward. Um, and uh, this is my last slide here. Make sure you stay within the 25 page limit. Use simple and concise language. Uh, don't use jargon or acronyms. Make sure the proposal is consistent with the purpose area goals and objectives and for serving victims of crime and be realistic how you're going to achieve those goals. Remember, you have 36 months to complete your project. Thanks, I'm gonna move it on. Great, thank you so much, Allison. Oh, go ahead, Jay. All right, so Jessica, are there questions at this point or should we move into the next slide? The questions that we have can be addressed at the end. Okay, great, thanks. Great, so I'm gonna talk a little bit more about some of the documents that have already uh, been addressed. Again, if you joined us late or if you just need a reminder, over in your um, control panel for the webinar, there's a handout section and the documents that I'll be discussing in the next few slides are all available there. Um, you can, if you click on them, you should be able to download them and save them to your computer. What you'll see over there, the last of the documents is called templates.pdf. Um, TLPI and NCAI developed a few sample application templates. Um, as Chia said at the outset of the webinar, we really um, developed these, or we actually developed them last year, we refined them this year, and the idea was just to provide some support, especially for tribes who um, aren't exactly sure where to start and need some help framing their thinking or some um, ideas to get the thoughts flowing. Um, as Allison and Jerry and everybody has, has stressed on this webinar, it, it 
it will not work well for you to cut and paste from these templates into your application. You really need to do the work to figure out how to describe the situation in your tribal community and your plans for um, addressing victim services in your tribal communities. But we hope that these samples, uh, the sample templates that we've made available um, are useful to you and encourage you to, um, to use them to the extent that they are. Next slide. The other thing that we've made available uh, in the document that's labeled five sample program narratives redacted, we asked, we've heard from, you know, as, as TLPI and NCI have been talking about this grant program over the last couple of years, one of the things that we regularly hear from grant writers, from tribes who are interested, is that they would like to see examples of successful past applications. Um, DOJ has made some of those available through the CTAS process. Um, we asked a couple of tribes uh, who received funding last year if they would be willing to share their narratives with others who are interested, and that's what you'll find um, in that PDF. Again, you know, I think this can't be said enough. The, so the application requirements changed dramatically between last year and this year. So we still think that these successful um, applications are useful to you to, to give you some ideas about the kinds of things other tribes are doing, uh, but, the, but the way they wrote it up was meant to be responsive to last year's solicitation, not this year's solicitation. So if you, um, you will need to uh, take a different approach and make sure that you are being responsive to the requirements for this year's solicitation. So the first um, example that you'll see in that document um, comes from a tribe that was proposing some activities related to renovating their uh, their shelter, their domestic violence shelter. Um, they specifically were trying to deal with um, some building code and fire standards, um, some accessibility issues for folks um, with disabilities. And they also knew that they needed to make some modifications to their shelter to be able to better accommodate both male victims um, or victims who need to come into shelter with their teenage sons. In the same application, the tribe was proposing to expand their child advocacy center's ability to perform medical exams on site. They needed um, some additional equipment for that. So again, this is a good example of the way in which um, a single tribe was applying um, for funding that was related to um, different tribal, you know, multiple tribal programs. Okay, next slide, please. The second example you'll find in those sample program narratives um, was from a tribe that was uh, wanting to create a, a couple of new part-time shelter positions. They were talking about the need, they wanted to make sure that they could always have more than one person um, on staff at the shelter. They also wanted some funding to create care kits that they gave, they would distribute to victims as they were on their way out of shelter, um, some children's activities for their play area. They wanted a new, um, a new backup generator to make sure that they would, um, you know, that the shelter was prepared if it lost power, uh, to purchase uh, vehicles for victim transportation to help them get to court, to services, et cetera. Um, and also they wanted to develop some culturally appropriate educational resource materials. So again, this was another um, proposal that was really kind of focused on services that were being provided uh, within the shelter, but taking a different approach than the first one in terms of specific activities. So the next slide. The third narrative that's included in that packet uh, was a tribe that was really focused on um, uh, hiring and personnel. So they were um, looking to hire a full-time social worker, a legal advocate, um, some administrative support. They also wanted to knew that they would need to contract with outside consultants to help um, with the provision of trauma-informed care for victims. Um, they wanted to upgrade some of their case management and data collection software. Um, and then also be using uh, the funds also to support the provision of, of victim services. Next slide. Um, in this one, um, the tribe was proposing uh, some additional training for their staff. Uh, again, purchasing of vehicles. Uh, at this tribe, it was um, they have an emergency closet for supplies for victims. Um, 
that that you know a, a wide range of things you know from uh, sanitary products, diapers, food, etc. That victims may need. Um, the tribe also wanted to to con to contract with um, a female traditional healer who could provide um, uh, who could provide services to victims. Um, they were going to contract with some attorneys to support the victims. Um, hire a trauma informed counselor through a sub award. Um, rent additional space for staff housing, and we're looking at ways to expand their victim comp a victim compensation fund um, to the extent that the, the state fund wasn't meeting the needs in that community. Next slide. And the, the last one was um, uh, an application that came in through CTAS Purpose Area 7. So again, different even than the others, which had been um, in last through last year's uh, standalone solicitation. Um, the tribe was focused on creating a multidisciplinary team uh, focused on um, uh, elder abuse and child abuse. Um, and then they were also looking to hire uh, a victim advocate. So I would encourage you to check out those uh, program narratives. Again, I think sometimes, um, you know, seeing how other tribes are approaching issues, how they're describing the need, um, you know, can really be useful in helping um, brainstorm about your what your own approach will be. Next slide. And I think Jerry, this is back to you. Actually, actually, it's uh, to Jessica. Oh, sorry, Jessica. Okay. <laughs> And that's my thank you, Virginia, and thanks to everybody who's still holding on here on the webinar. My name is Jessica Hardshow, Operations Director of Tribal Law and Policy Institute, and we wanted to dive in to important budget information. As Allison mentioned earlier, the budget is worth 20% of the review criteria, so we do encourage you to work very closely with whoever will be doing your budget to ensure that there's a clear link between the narrative and the budget. There is a budget preparation and submission information section that is highlighted in the RFP on page 11 and also page 14. And it's a link that you actually need to click on. And once you click on that link, it's going to take you to a whole nother area where there's additional budget information that should be considered. And that's the OJP Grant Application Resource Guide. Whoever will be doing your budget, you want to make sure that they have gone to this resource guide and read all the information in this section. Because oftentimes, if you just print out the RFP, it's missed that this is actually a link to another area that you need to um, get information from. And the budget detail worksheet is now a required Excel worksheet, and that can be found at this link that is provided in this slide. It's also provided on the RFP itself. And we did want to point out that this is a, a challenging Excel uh, worksheet. Um, I assist TLPI in doing the budgets, and I, I am very familiar with this form, and it can be very difficult to work with. So we wanted to provide you with my information, my email address here. If you are having any challenges with the template, we'd be more than happy to assist you with uh, the Excel template. Next slide. We wanted to point out in this next section that there are required travel that should be included in your budget. So uh, applicants that are applying from the lower 48 states, you wanna make sure that you budget at least $15,000 over the three-year grant period. And if you're from Alaska, you want to budget at least $20,000 in your budget for required travel to some of these sponsored DOJ trainings, which include the new grantee orientation, the National Indian Nations Conference, and the OBC mandatory training. So you want to make sure whoever's doing your budget, that they are setting aside those funds for those required travel and training. And they can use the Washington, D.C. FY 2019 per diem rates for those estimates. Next slide. And in this next section, we wanted to just make sure that we're highlighting um, some important takeaways and lessons learned and tips that can help your budget writer. So the, the first uh, key detail is you want to make sure that there's a detailed computation for each budget line item. And the way that the worksheet 
is now um, it's you pretty much can't um, you can't not put in a detail. Um, it's it's a requirement now, so it's it's built into the worksheet. So that part is pretty much taken care of, but you want to make sure that you're you're really itemizing all of your expenses there. The the hard part is the actual narrative part, and we want to just point out that a thorough and clear description should be provided for every cost that you're you're listing out on that worksheet. And oftentimes, what we're seeing is that there'll be maybe one or two sentences and there's no description whatsoever for one of the line items that is being included in the budget. You also want to make sure that you're describing how your program will maximize cost effectiveness. I know that's a, sort of a hard term uh, for folks and we'd be more than happy to provide more guidance or examples on that if you need, but you want to be uh, building into your narrative how you're going to maximize costs either using uh, estimates, your procurement process, you wanna build in language, for example, that you're going to be using the most cost-effective um, travel company or flight option, rental car company, et cetera. You wanna make sure that you're justifying the proposed costs in relationship to alternatives. A lot of times this is just completely missed by folks that are doing your budget. So, for example, if you would like to have an in-person meeting, you'd want to justify why that's important versus a webinar. That's a pretty good example of an alternative, and you want to just make sure that you're including a justification for that. You also want to make sure that you're describing how the proposed costs will be cost-effective and that they're allowable. So you want to just build in that type of language into that narrative section. And next slide. You also want to make sure that you're explaining how costs are estimated and calculated. I know this is a little bit tricky for folks, but here's an example. If you're getting your flight estimates for travel from Expedia, you can simply indicate that estimates are based on current rates found on Expedia or from similar uh, trips of this nature, something like that would, would suffice. And Allison touched upon the most important part earlier in her presentation on the budget. You want to explain how costs are necessary to the completion of the proposed project. And this is where we often see the biggest disconnect of information. So you want to make sure that your budget uh, whoever's completing your budget is connecting all of those costs to the proposed plan, the activities, and our deliverables. And a good example would be uh, maybe you have a, a time task plan that is saying task one will be to attend one of these trainings. And then you can connect that specific task to that cost in your narrative. And and this is where you just want to make sure that you're you're double checking that your budget writer is really pulling in all of those proposed plan activities uh, to your budget and, and making sure that they're all connecting here. And again, a strong budget narrative, it really should be about several paragraphs long or more. You can, there's an add button on the Excel worksheet where you can actually add in more space for narrative if you need to. I think oftentimes whoever's doing the budget they may not know that they can add more space or they they get intimidated by the worksheet and they'll maybe only fit in one or two sentences but typically that's not adequate and not enough information to really get that full 20 percent of your reviewer score next slide please and um, in this next section we just wanted to highlight some very important additional resources for you the OVC website link is provided here. There's a link to the solicitation and also the FAQs and the OVC pre-application web, webinar. So you can click on any of these additional resources to help. Next slide, please. And also, if you need additional help, there's information from uh, on the National Crime Justice Reference Service 
Response Center, their phone number, email, as well as a web chat link. Um, we also provided the GMS support hotline if you have any issues while you're completing the application, you can feel free to contact them as well. I know they're they're trying to pull up the, the webinar here, but I did want to just open it up for any questions that folks may have. Uh, feel free to add your questions in the chat box. And um, we do have some questions that came up earlier that maybe Allison can address. Allison, if you're still on, um, we had one question regarding, um, actually, let's see here. We have had some questions regarding formula funding for OVC tribal set-aside. Do you know how OVC determines population? If it's census, do you know how OVC utilizes population information? For example, on or off reservation, um, and the, in the census questions, there's the, the detail of, you know, two or more races, a loan in combination. So they, the question is, um, knowing this information would drastically change which scenario would be the most beneficial for a tribe. So OVC's funding does not go out under formula. Tribal funding is not under a formula. Uh, it is on an individual application basis. So we use no formula to assess that. We rely on what you provide us in the application. That's why your detail is important. Uh, as Virginia mentioned, we are doing a uh, consultation in uh, August. Uh, one of the questions in there was some data put in by uh, Office of Tribal Justice about uh, somebody's proposed uh, formula. There's been no commitment to a formula or no formula that's been used. It would be important for folks to provide their input about any formula that OVC would consider. Uh, the ultimate decision about that does not lie with OVC, but it is something that is being considered. Okay, thank you. Another question that came in is they have a consortium of tribes that are applying for creating a shelter and staffing it. It will cost a significant amount of money that we will be able to demonstrate with our narrative and budget. Will OVC consider what we need and fund it? We have absolutely are no way to about... answer that until we see it. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Right. They said we... that. Sure. <laughs> right, right. Yeah, they said we're concerned about putting so much work into the application uh, just to be denied. So, I mean, um, one of the things would I would not be realistic. No, one of the things I would say about that is that, you know, there is an expansive amount of money that can be used for this, but it also has to be balanced across all of the applications that we receive. Uh, we have not had to consider with this set-aside funding any limit ultimately on the applications that were made, luckily, because there's been a sufficient amount of money, but certainly if folks are coming in for way over what the limit is, that will may press to those boundaries of that. The other piece is that uh, any suggestion for something like that obviously cannot include construction costs and probably needs to be based on a legitimate uh, community needs assessment, a strategic plan, things of those nature. So if you have all of that work that has been done already, I suggest that you attach that to your application so that we can make an informed decision about whether it's possible uh, to actually fund it. But again, in a hypothet hypothetical state without seeing that, that's difficult for us for me to respond to. Okay, thank you. And I know a couple participants have asked for the slides. As a reminder, we will be sending out the slides and handouts at the conclusion of the webinar, so those will be provided. If you have any other further questions, please enter the question in the question box on the platform. And hi, this is Allison. I also want to remind folks to go to www.ovc gov we have a tribal set aside specific page there is a another uh, series of webinars that were done at least one of which is recorded maybe more than one and those slides from that uh, the first ones that were done are are longer and have more specific detail uh, and also Jessica calling your attention she did to NCJRS which is the source of specific questions you might have substantive questions, please be sure to use those resources. And when you go into grants.gov, grants.gov itself has all sorts of tutorials about that. 
the technical part of using grants.gov. It has a YouTube page, it has a mobile app. So there are resources for that technical aspect as well. Wonderful, thank you. Another question came in, OVC states rent can be used for mobile home. Can we rent housing or apartments instead? You can rent uh, buildings uh, or apartments that are used for specific purposes, but you can't pay yourself, so to speak. So you gotta be careful about that. So you can't, for example, if it's on tribal land, rent it from the tribe because that would be considered self-pay. Mortgages are unallowable. The purchase of real property are unallowable. Uh, I suggest that folks go to the allowable and unallowable chart that was referenced numerous times uh, here that is contained in the solicitation. And I also call people's attention to look at the DOJ financial guide, which is also available online. Okay, great. And just one follow-up to the consortium question. Uh, there is no limit mentioned, um, so we just wanted to make sure that there was no limit mentioned for consortium, so I just want to make sure there's not any rules around that, Allison. So we said that the maximum is 720 unless there is a sufficient justification given, um, and that would have to be substantial if someone's going to go substantially over what that limitation is. Okay, thank you. Any further questions from our participants? Just give people a few minutes to type in any questions they may have. Okay, well, it looks like those are, oh, actually, we got one more question here. Are there any resources to help develop a needs assessment? Uh, so a needs assessment is something that you can use uh, funding to pay for under those circumstances. Uh, you would be able to hire a consultant at the uh, uh, consultant rate to be able to bring in someone to develop that for you. Uh, there are resources available around what those things look like uh, on uh, the OVC TTAC Training and Technical Assistance site, and that is a great resource anyway for folks to, uh, if you're especially looking to develop a program or you have a new victim advocacy program, to look for resources there. Um, but it, it uh, is something that you could actually use, utilize funding. The going rate generally for consultants under a federal grant is $650 a day. Again, I suggest you go to the uh, DOJ financial guide to get more details about that. Allison, this is uh, Jerry. Do you, are there things that, the, that uh, the OVC tribal TA providers may have developed that would help with um, a needs assessment or a strategic planning that, that would be tribal specific resources? They do have resources. And for our CTAS grantees, the, we handled this differently. The CTAS grantees in the past have had as a required deliverable under their grant that they do, if they have not done one within a certain period of time, a community needs assessment, a strategic plan, and a logic model. Uh, under this set aside, that is not a required deliverable. Uh, however, uh, we, the TA providers are the same. It's Fox Valley Technical College and um, Unified Solutions, and they do have resources that they can certainly share with folks uh, for the following uh, for helping them do those as well. And so if, if, if the person who asked the question or, or others wanted those to connect with those resources, they could send an email to us and we'll try to um, connect, make the connections there. Yeah, I mean, I would say, I mean, those things are, are uh, they certainly can look at the resource so perhaps they understand what is involved in doing so. I think that might be helpful. Um, those resources obviously will not be available for the TA providers to provide during the application process, but they certainly can provide materials that have been developed with grant funding from us. Okay, great. Yes, so we, we will email you offline um, for the participant who asked about the needs assessment. It looks like those are all the questions that have come through. If there is any other further questions, um, feel free to email any of us here um, on the contact slide.
And with that, Jerry, would you like to do a closing? Um, sure. I, I, um, on behalf of, of TLPI, I'd just like to thank thank everyone and, and encourage you all to, to consider applying. It's a really important funding source, um, and, and we really want to be able to maximize and show that tribes um, have the have the great have a great need for for this kind of funding. Um, uh, Virginia, did you want to do any closing words on behalf of NCAI? Uh, just to again thank Allison for her time in joining us and TLPI for all the work put into uh, putting the webinar together, and to remind everybody that in addition to uh, applying for the grant, we hope that you will participate in the tribal consultation on August 20th. If you aren't able to travel to be there in person, you can also submit uh, testimony and comments in writing. So I hope that you all will um, will use that as an opportunity to engage in a dialogue about this funding source uh, going forward. But thank you all so much for joining us today. And please let us know how we can help you if you have questions that come up as you finalize your applications over the next few weeks. And, and I, I would just add also that we'll be posting the resources here that they'll be being sent to you to you all um, by email following the, this webinar. But we'll also be posting them on the homepage of the Tribal Court Clearinghouse at tlpi.org. Um, and, and so if you wanted to refer others to it or, or you're trying to track down the resources, we will be posting them there. Thank you. And, and I believe that that concludes the webinar. Thank, thanks, everyone.